Joshua Laycock, the founder and engineer of 3D Topo Incorporated. Uh, we make a number of 3D products, uh, and uh, this is the newest addition to the family. Um, it's a, right now, it's currently a three-axis CNC machine. Uh, I will be adding a fourth and fifth axis to it soon. We used a number of uh, 3D printed parts, including these cable chains. We also designed uh, this parameterized uh, limit switch mount. Um, it's available on Thingiverse. Uh, it's customizable, so it can be used for um, all the axes. Uh, you can find that uh, on Thingiverse. Just look for 3D Topo. Uh, that's the number three, the letter D, T-O-P-O. -O. I also needed a customized part to attach this Z plate to our Z ball screw. I couldn't just print a plastic part for that because the forces uh, under load will be just too much for a plastic part. So I uh, used what I call as the lost PLA casting process and uh, essentially printed a, a plastic model of the part and then uh, made a mold and then burnt out the plastic and filled it with molten aluminum. It's essentially the same as the lost wax process that's been uh, used for hundreds of years. Um, but instead of wax uh, original, we're using a printed uh, PLA part. Uh, let's have a look at that part on the back of the machine. Here's the casted part uh, in service on the machine. And what I'd like to do now is uh, show you the process that I use going from design to 3D print to the final casted part. So the first thing I did is downloaded the, the dimensional drawings for the ball screw that we're making a part for. And based on this, we had to look up the dimensions and lay out a drawing, uh, which I did here in Adobe Illustrator. And then what I did is I imported uh, these shapes that I needed into OpenSCAD. And uh, I did a uh, extrusion on a block. And then I did extrusion on those parts that you saw the outlines for. And then I did a Boolean operation. So there it is in OpenSCAD. And then next we did a 3D print of it. And uh, there's uh, the 3D print. Then I test fitted it on the ball screw. And when it fit perfectly the way I wanted, I uh, printed it again at 103%. Uh, to account for the shrinkage of the uh, aluminum casting. So uh, here we have our printed part. Um, I filed it down a little bit, made it nice and smooth around the edges. What we need to do is uh, we're going to use some styrofoam to cut ourselves a, a place to connect the, the molten metal where we're going to pour in. Um, and uh, those are called gates and runners. The gates actually attach to the part um, and they will be cut off with a hacksaw. Um, and I'm going to go on this side because uh, I need very high tolerance on this and, and on the sides it doesn't really matter so much. Um, so I have here half inch styrofoam and one inch styrofoam. Uh, the half inch foam I'm going to use to make the gate and, gates and runner. We'll use this long piece here as a uh, runner. And actually, it's long enough to do to make our gates from it. So I'm gonna make this the width. Actually, a little bit longer. We we want our gate to be a little bit longer. So if there's any sand or imperfections in the mold, it has a place to go before it fills our actual part here. Okay. So this will be our gate, and then we need two. I'm sorry, this is the runner, and then we need two gates, which um, are just short little pieces of material here. That's a gate, and I'll do one the same size. Okay, so those are our gates, that's our runner. We need to glue that onto there, and then glue that onto there, like that. Um, actually, going to make them a little bit narrower. So we got our hot glue uh, gun here all heated, ready to go. Hopefully. One thing about the hot glue and the styrofoam is the hot glue is a bit hot for the styrofoam. So 
um, it will um, in fact melt it more than we would like um, so what I do is um, I get some sacrificial piece of metal and put it on there which gives it a chance to cool down a little be a heat sink there and then I'm going to wipe it on and attach it to our runner and same with this one voila and then we uh, need to attach this to our part okay so again this is our runner and these are called gates now we need to make what's called a sprue and the sprue is actually where when this is buried in the mold we're going to pour the metal into it so for that I'm going to use this one inch and on our sprue we want it an angle um, to build up pressure so I'm cutting this at an angle here Oh shoot. Well, that's okay. This foam's got an imperfection. I'm just going to cut it off right there. Okay. And then we're going to glue this on to like right there. So we now have our uh, sprue to the gate, I mean to the runner, which connects to the gate. This also acts, it's called a riser. And, and a riser is a big pool of um, molten metal that as this solidifies, it's gonna shrink and, and have a reservoir of molten metal to pull into. Otherwise, uh, we'll get um, defects and voids in our casting. I'm also gonna add Another riser on this side, um, we'll just use a single gate, like that, and we'll put, um, we'll put like a riser over here too. That way, as the part solidifies, it, it can draw from both sides. It is pretty thin here, so uh, we want to be able to feed in both sides of the, the casting. Um, so I'm going to glue this gate on. Okay, and next I'm going to make a, another, well, it's, it's going to look like the sprue, but it's actually going to be a riser. on there and then we have a riser the nice thing about having a riser on both sides too is when we pour in the metal on this side uh, we're gonna see the the metal pour all the way through and then rise up through here so we know that we filled our mold completely um, and it also doubles as a vent so all the all the air and everything else has a place to go There's our complete gated and riser uh, and runner assembly. So next what we're going to do is prepare our 
um, investment, which is a mix of plaster of Paris and sand. And then um, we're gonna bury this in there. I went ahead and measured out seven cups of playground sand. Uh, it's a bit wet, we brought it in from the snow out there. So um, I'm gonna measure in now seven cups of plaster of Paris and um, then we'll do the water. One. And it's very important to use some sand in here, otherwise uh, the plaster of Paris uh, will not uh, live up to the temperature required for casting aluminum. I'm just going to go and mix this up before we put the water in. Before you actually pour the water in, you got to make sure everything is ready to go because this stuff does set up really fast. Um, and for that reason, make sure to always mix more than you think you need. Uh, it sucks to have to do a second batch uh, when, when the thing's setting up, so. Okay, so uh, we need a, uh, something to hold our mold and our investment. So um, this is gonna be a perfect size, I think, for, for what we need to cast. Um, so, uh, and I like recycling old things, so I'm just gonna cut this off uh, right here. Make sure that you know your part fits in there nicely. We have enough below and on top and all the sides. Okay, looks perfect. Um, the other thing we're going to need uh, before you actually add the water to your investment is you're going to need a vibrator to get all the air out. And so what I've done is um, I uh, got a I bent a screw and put a bunch of washers offset. So when this thing spins around from my drill here. Um, it, it makes a nice vibrator. Oh, I need to go faster. Like that. So we need to uh, mix in our water now. And the general rule of thumb is half the amount of, uh, of total. So we have 14 cups of total investment in here. Uh, seven of sand, seven of plaster. So we need approximately seven cups of water. One, four. I'm gonna start with that and mix it, see how it looks. The consistency we're going for is, um, we're going for something like soup. Not so much like stew, um, but a, a nice thick soup. And it looks like four might be pretty good. Um, you want the minimal amount of water really, but you also need it to be able to fill in our, our holes and everything like that. So, um, and plaster Paris is normally half the volume in water, but since we have some sand in here and it was already moist, um, it looks like we're not gonna need seven cups. Hey, that's looking pretty good. I like it. Um, good consistency. So we're gonna go ahead and pour this into the mold. Not all of it, we're just gonna pour in enough for a base. Something like that. And then I'm gonna position my part. Just go ahead and set that in there like that. And then we're gonna pour the rest of this in. It wants to float, so kind of got to keep it down. What did I say about mixing enough? <laughs> it looks like we could actually use a little more. I think I'm going to cheat and use this to offset some volume. That's pretty good days okay so next what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna vibrate this as you vibrate you can usually see some air bubbles coming up which is a good sign that your vibrations doing its job 
There's actually not as much as I would like here on top, so I think I'm actually going to pour some more in on top. But since our whole mold's um, surrounded by a good coat, I think it will be fine. It keeps wanting to rise up, so it's starting to set up already. But you might want to put a weight here on top of it or something. Okay, so I mixed up another batch, and I'm just going to pour it here on top. Of course, we need to be careful not to bury um, our sprue or riser. I think this looks good. Uh, we're just going to let this set up for a couple of hours and then uh, we're going to be ready to put it in the furnace and burn the plastic out. our hard lid so I just got some ceramic blanket I happen to have laying around which is great insulation fireproof uh, and uh, so I put that on top and uh, we still have a vent here for the gases to come out okay so uh, what we have here this is called a cope and drag it's a two-part we're making two-part castings but we just want anything that will hold sand for this uh, we don't need a two-part uh, cope and drag um, so I'm gonna pour some sand in Once uh, the plastics burn out, uh, we're going to take that out and we're going to set it in here and then uh, bury the rest of it in sand for support around the, uh, the mold. Alright, so it's been about an hour I guess and um, we're going to flip this thing around so we can uh, more evenly distribute the heat through our mold. Uh, if you can see in there, this, this cherry color, it's, it's right probably around a thousand degrees in there roughly. Was another half an hour now that we flipped it around and uh, then we'll be ready to start melting some metal okay so what I'm looking for now it's, it's actually been the most popular question about this process is when to know if the molds done heated out enough and you can see the inside of that hole there is getting a little cherry red so what we're waiting for is uh, we want to see a little bit of color down there in the hole so we know that it's uh, uh, penetrated the, the whole mold and it's gotten plenty hot to melt any plastic that might be in there. And it looks like it won't be much longer.
in here, I marked it with an X so we know which one we wanted to pour in because this has two gates and that only has one. Uh, now we're going to cover it with some aluminum foil so when we pack this with sand we won't uh, get any sand in our mold. off the top here. Okay. So we're, I went ahead and cut these out of uh, aluminum uh, cans and uh, we're going to put one here and we're going to put one here. And what this does is it will give us additional hydrostatic pressure to fill the mold and it will also act as a riser. boundary from the moisture. We'll do that uh, right before we're ready to pour. Okay, so uh, this is a, an ingot I made from scrap. Uh, you normally don't want to just melt your scrap right, right away. This helps get rid of all the impurities. And I marked it with no copper, so this is just straight aluminum. We're going to add a little copper to the mix uh, after this melts. So we got a pot full of molten metal. Uh, I'm gonna add some copper to it to make it a really nice alloy. Uh, right now, aluminum by itself is pretty cruddy material. You can't just put this into the metal because it probably has moisture in here. And because uh, if we add this to the, the molten metal without getting the moisture out right now, they'd be, become pipe bomb. All right, so I think our copper is nice and hot now. So I'm going to pull these out and uh, put the lid on. So I'm just going to melt one at a time so uh, we don't shock the pot. Okay, so uh, we got all the copper melted and I preheated my skimmers to make sure there's no trap moisture in here. And we're going to skim the dross off the top. Okay, so I spilled a bit more than I would have liked, but we see that it came up and gave us a nice riser here, which means it filled the mold and, and came up. Uh, so I'm hopeful it's gonna turn out. Uh, we're gonna give it about 45 minutes and then we'll open it. All right, so uh, hopefully it's all cooled down enough now. I'm gonna pour it out and um, hoping it's like Christmas around here. There we go.
you can see our riser and our screw. I see metal. Oh yeah, it's looking real good. I'd say it came out perfect. Oh yeah. Beautiful. I'm gonna see it straight out of the mold. Look at that machined looking surface. So, I think at this point I'm gonna bring it on inside and get some water on here so it's a little easier to work with. All right, now we're gonna cool it down. Almost there. So far, it's absolutely looking flawless. Beautiful. All right, so we cut the part off the, the gate, and um, only thing I did besides cutting the gates off was I drilled the holes out. It's a very nice casting, and uh, we're about to see how it fits on the part it was made for. So here's the moment of truth. We're gonna mate this with the part it was made for. And oh, look at that, just slides right on there. And uh, oh yeah, all the holes are lined up perfectly. And see how we did on the height. Oh, yes. <laughs> I don't think it could have possibly come out better than that. I'd like to just show you some basic foundry equipment. I expect you to have a, a basic understanding of foundry uh, equipment and work before you would ever attempt to do something like we're going to show you here. I've been casting for about 20 years um, and so uh, it's potentially a very dangerous and, and fatal um, hobby if, if you get in over your head. You got to read books and post any questions you have on forums. Um, but uh, overall, if it's something you have interest in, uh, it, it's certainly doable. Um, and, and actually, the whole molding process is, is quite simple. But there are some things with, with casting metal that are just absolutely fatal if you make a mistake. Like uh, water and mat molten metal just are a deadly combination. And um, even, even casting on top of cement can be fatal. Um, because the concrete holds uh, water in it and if you get molten metal on it uh, it will turn to steam inside the cement and, and actually explode. You'll have a, a pock mark out of your concrete and uh, you, you have flying metal and everything. It's just not a good thing. We are out here in the winter and it's definitely wetter than I'd like but I got the torch to melt out the, the ground around us so if I did drop any metal between here and here we're not on a big puddle of, of water or anything or on concrete. So that said, uh, I'll just show you some of the basic equipment that I use um, for this process. Um, the first thing is we have a burner, which this is called a Ron Reel type burner. Just Google Ron Reel burner and you can find a part list and uh, assembly instructions for building this from just simple uh, hardware store uh, plumbing parts. And that's all it is, it's just some plumbing parts with uh, some holes drilled in there, really nothing else. I actually am just using an air compressor hose to a, a 20 PSI regulator on the uh, propane tank there. Uh, so this is my furnace I built out of, um, I just got this metal tank from uh, the, the garbage uh, and the dump. And um, I, what I did is uh, we use this blanket, it's called, uh, well the name brand for it's KO wool, but it's just fiber blanket and it insulates really well. It's heat resistant to 2300 degrees. And so uh, on the inside of this, I just lined it with one inch of that. And then I uh, got a, uh, a, a mold for the, for the inside and then casted high temperature 3300 degree refractory, um, which um, I actually use Sparcast. And um, I got both the blanket and, and the uh, refractory on eBay. Um, so it's very simple other than the, the mold I put in the middle. I also had to make a mold for the inlet. And the inlet you want uh, coming in, you want the, the, the jet to come in at a tangent to the side. So you want that actually not coming straight in, but at a tangent. And what that does is it forces 
a nice spiral vortex of heat so it you're not just heating half your furnace it spirals all the way around uh, the lid it's also very simple um, like I actually used the Dremel tool to cut this in half and um, we have I put a, a metal bar through here and then it's lined with fiber blanket in the middle and casted refractory and again I had like a, a mold in there for the, the air vent and it just fits right on top like that uh, next bit of equipment you'll need is a crucible and this crucible um, I think it's a uh, silicon carbide and uh, very affordable for what it is I think it was like $30 or something like that um, and uh, you can find those on eBay or I got that I think from budget casting um, and then you need a set of tongs to to lift out generally um, this is a two-step part you would have tongs you'd bring it out and then you'd get a pouring shank but I am able to pour with this it's it's a bit awkward but you can certainly do it with just a set of tongs for a crucible this size and then we have this is a homemade skimmer I made this is a copper pipe uh, with some kitchen sort of draining thing I put on there what that does is it allows us to scoop the dross that floats to the top off the of the crucible before we pour. This is a sandbox. This is just playground sand, and when we put our mold in there, uh, it uh, it's reinforcement and allows us to to have a bigger, stronger mold with uh, without a lot of uh, refract refractory material used, um, which is uh, in this case uh, plaster of Paris mixed with sand. And then we got some safety equipment. So at minimum, we have uh, a pair of gloves you need to work with. Um, these are really nice, expensive proximity gloves. Uh, I got these from Budget Casting. Um, they're expensive, but a good investment, and they, they're really tough and protect your hands from, from extreme heat. Um, if you don't have these, just a pair of uh, leather like welding gloves will be better than nothing. Um, and then I have a proximity jacket, and um, this is kind of overkill for casting aluminum, but uh, it makes me feel better about any if a potential accident happened. I certainly would be glad I was wearing something like this. Um, I got that on eBay, a really good deal. And then I got some uh, proximity pants too on eBay. And so, uh, again, it's overkill, but uh, you can't be too safe when dealing with something that's potentially deadly. Um, I also got a proximity helmet here, and this is uh, maybe something more for casting steel or something, but uh, it protects my hair and my face and uh, my neck and everything when I'm casting. So uh, just, again, added layer of confidence and insurance. If you don't have a proximity helmet, please at least get a shield like this. Uh, there, there's just no excuse for not having this on, and if the worst happened, it would save you from from just lifelong traumatic scars. Uh, so uh, that's basically it for the equipment. The last thing that we have that we need for the process is a air compressor, um, and we'll show you uh, how that's used when we get into the actual casting process.